Jed Johnson from DieselCrew.com. One of the things that you might not know is that I run the North American Grip Sport website. I'm also on a committee called the International Grip Collective. So what I want to talk to you today is specifically about grip sport. So if you don't compete in grip sport, this video is not necessarily for you, but if it is something that you compete in, have passed in the past, competed in, or are wanting to in the future, this is something that you want to check out because this is something fairly new. Just this year, we instituted weight classes and uh, instituted a master's division in grip sport. So what we did is we actually took the, for the most part, the weight classes from the IPF, International Powerlifting Federation. And we use those weight classes. Now why is this important? What we found is there is a correlation between many of the grip sport lifts and body weight. We also saw for many years that the people that were of, of a heavier body weight would generally finish ahead of people of a lighter body weight category. So we saw the need for the weight classes and we went, in, we went ahead and instituted them. So we now have records lists based around all these weight classes. Aaron Corcoran drew up a database that collects all of the information from grip contests, associates it with weight classes, and then lists it all in, in a top 50 format, or maybe even more than that. But, it, but it's in a format so you can very easily compare lifts within the same classes. So, this is important because it's another step that we've taken forward with the sport to make it more understandable and more fair, in this case, to all competitors. So while there isn't always, you know, not all events are always uh, dependent upon body weight, but many of them are. So it makes sense to go ahead and administer all of the events in this way. Now not all contests will have all of these divisions contested. For instance, one of the annual contests that takes place all over the globe is the World's Strongest Hands series. Often there's an open weight class, which includes everybody that is competing, and then there will be a divider line at one of the certain weight divisions, and then those folks will all compete amongst themselves. So this year, I believe that was the 83 kilo class, either 83 or 93. I'm not quite sure going off my memory. But it makes for, it makes for everything be a little bit more fair, and it's pretty cool to see where everybody uh, ranks amongst one another, uh, amongst one another within the same body weight classes. So let's go ahead and take a look at the body weight classes, and then I've got another part of this that I want to talk about. So, again, I, I am a part of North American Grip Sport, which if you haven't heard of it, if you see NAGS, that's, that's what we're talking about there. And it's just, it's the governing body, if you will. It's the guideline set for Grip Sport in North America. Um, so here are the men's weight classes. We have 59 kilos, 66 kilos, 74 kilos, 83 kilos, 93 kilos, 105 kilos, 120 kilos, and then 120 plus. So this would be like your unlimited class. If you've got like a, a wrestling background, those are your, that's your uh, unlimited. The women's weight classes, 47 kilos, 52 kilos, 57 kilos, 63 kilos, 72 kilos, 84 kilos, and 84 plus. So that would be the unlimited for women. So again, we didn't just pull these out of the sky. These are... Uh, part of the structure of the IPF. We also have master's divisions for 50 to 59, 60 to 69, 70 to 79, and 80 plus, and then the weight classes uh, for what, whether they're men or women would, would fit into that as well. Uh, now, here is maybe a more important part of this equation. Uh, we have some requirements 
in order to have people ranked amongst these weight classes. And it's called point calibration. Okay? So let's say, let's say you have a scale that's certified every six months. You have some professional come in and verify that that scale is completely accurate. Then all you have to do is just use your scale. But a lot of us don't have those scales. I know in my case, I'm just using a, a bathroom scale. So what we've done is we've established a different means in order to do what we call point calibration. So what you would do is you would have to first go and weigh your barbell plates. You would go to the post office or some other place that has a calibrated scale and you would weigh your barbell plates. That is what I did. It took me about six months in order to get all of my weights weighed. But, you know, once, once you go in there and you become friends with the people at the post office, a lot of times they'll let you use your scale. It's just that you can't take 40 plates in there all at once. You're going you're gonna to upset those people. So what I did over the course of about six months is I went in there almost every single day with two to four plates and I was able to weigh the plates. From there, you take like a white pen, a marker pen, and you write on the plate how much it weighs or you identify that plate and then have a log book where you write down the identifier. So if the plate is number one, then you write down one equals and then whatever it weighs. Because almost you'll almost never find a weight plate that weighs exactly what it weighs. It'll almost never happen. Sometimes it's heavy, sometimes it's lighter. But you have to catalog how much all of your, your weights weigh. From there, you need to find the total number of weight that matches these weight classes. So let's say I have a mess of 45 pound plates, 25s, 10s, and 5s, and I'm able to find these a certain number of kilos, 59 kilos, 66 kilos. If I know that that weight, after being compared to a calibrated scale, after being pl placed on a calibrated scale, is equal to those weights, then I'm very, very confident that I know how much the pile of weights weighs. From there, you put that on your scale, you're able to get a readout on your scale. So let's say that you're testing for 59 kilos. You have 59 kilos in a pile on your scale, or maybe you have it on a vertical bar or some other, like a loading pin device, and you know how much that weighs as well. You put that right on your scale, and it'll give you a readout. Well, maybe instead of 59 kilos, it says 58.5 kilos, or 59.7 kilos. You have to log that in there. So for for 59 kilos, you know that your scale reads a little bit heavy or a little bit light, but you write that down. So the point calibration for 59 kilos on your scale is whatever it reads, 59.7 kilos. So you write that down. You th excuse me. You then do the same thing for each one of these markers, or at least for the divisions that you're going to be contesting at your contest. So if you know you have eight people coming, and it's two days before the contest, and you know that they're all going to be right around only two or three weight classes, then for that given contest, you only have to point calibrate your scale at those two or three weight classes. This sounds like a big, a big hassle, but it really doesn't take a lot of time. The biggest thing is getting your plates weighed. And, and that'll, take, that'll probably take a while, but you just want to start this out ahead of time. And don't go at lunchtime when it's really busy. Go during the downtime hours. Don't go right before they leave at night. Go, you know, sometime in the afternoon. Spread it out and, uh, and don't overwhelm them. Unless you can kind of make an appointment with the person and find out when is a good time for them. And then you can go take all of your plates there. And then it's, it's a matter of working it into your schedule. But that's the process that I did in order to weigh all my plates. Um, at one time, all my plates were weighed. I've since bought more and I haven't had to had to weigh them because I've got enough weight. All right, but that's the process that we use. We're able to point calibrate our scale to know where to know where each division is on the scale, and then the person has to weigh in no earlier than two hours prior to the beginning of the competition. So if you're going to have a startup at ten, people can't weigh in until eight a.m. or after. All right. So that's really how that works. Again, we do a lot of work to make, uh, to, to continually push the sport forward, 
and take it out of loose requirements and things like that and make things more strict so you know so that we can have long-standing records that actually mean something instead of saying now I wonder if they went through and found all the lightest plates that they have and used those instead of using heavier plates it takes all the doubt away okay so again I'm Jed Johnson I'm going to be putting out more videos that are associated with North American Grip Sport and the International Grip Collective uh, we're not necessarily a governing body but we do put out the guidelines to help people run their own competitions as we go forward, we'll, we'll continue to communicate different things that we have, that we've, uh, that we've worked on. All right, thanks for your time. Make sure to subscribe if you're a Grip Sport competitor because I'll be putting more things out as we come to them. Thanks a lot and all the best. Take care.